Good morning. Are you guys ready to launch right into this this week? I'm a little fired up this morning. There's no intro to this. We're just, we're diving in. Is that all right? You guys ready? <laughs> I, I started off this series just a few weeks ago by saying that not everything is the devil, right? Not everything is the enemy working against us. In fact, we do a pretty good job of that all by ourselves. <laughs> But some of it is, just because all of it isn't, doesn't mean some of it is, I'm mixing up my words, but we don't need all that much help, but some of it is sometimes Satan. And sometimes, it's not one or the other, it's both. We talked last week about truth and deception, right? And how Satan is really good at deceiving us because we so often want to be deceived, We want to. We're out here believing so many lies the enemy has for us that he doesn't even need to continue telling them anymore. We tell them to each other. We perpetuate the lies all the time. We start spreading them ourselves where we're living our lives based on knowledge from culture, from the world, from our parents, grandparents, neighbors, sisters, uncles, cousins. But if we'd use a little discernment, once in a while, some of us just need to step back and say, Let me look at my advice givers here for a second, right? Do I want my life to reflect theirs? Should I be taking advice from this particular avenue, right? It's just, can we just be real? Some of us shouldn't be taking advice from our our families, our friends, our coworkers. If we look at our lives, their lives a little bit, step back, just use a little discernment. I'm not saying go around judging everybody but using discernment, we should be going to a more reliable source for our information, okay? Some of us, we're out here reading self-help books like crazy, but we haven't cracked open the Bible in ages. The Bible is the most reliable source of information that exists. The most important book you will ever read and the most consequential. It is the cheat code for the game of life. It is God revealing his plan, his his cosmic plan, but also his individual beautiful love story plan. It's, we don't read it enough. I don't care how much you're reading it. You're not reading it enough. Ignorance in this case is expensive. Hosea, the prophet of Hosea said, my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. I cannot have a good life if I'm, I'm living it based on bad information, right? This is why who and what we allow to influence our life is so important. I'm saying all of this today as an intro to the next part of this Armor of God suit up series the breastplate, or the body armor of righteousness, okay? We're going to read Ephesians 6 again today, just like last week. I want you to hear the beginning of this. So, verse 11, put on all of God's armor. Remember last week, all of armor, all of the armor, not just a piece of it. Wherever you're unclothed, you're uncovered. Put on all God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. He's cunning. He has strategies against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor, so you you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. That's the piece we're going to focus on today. We can't protect ourselves against all the strategies of the devil properly without the breastplate of righteousness. I'm using those terms interchangeably because in my head, I have it memorized as the breastplate of righteousness, right? This piece that covers. But I think body armor, as the NLT puts it, is actually a more modern term. We know body armor. Our soldiers, our police forces, our whatever, they wear body armor, right? It's a very important piece of their uniform. In fact, it covers the essential pieces for life. The heart, the lungs, all the essential organs in the chest cavity, right? 
you get shot in an extremity, an arm, leg, whatever, you, I mean, you could bleed out, but you, you might limp, you, you might lose that limb, but probably you'll live. If you get shot in the heart, game over, right? So if you leave this part of your body uncovered, you'll, you'll not just get destroyed or stolen from. Remember the three objectives of the enemy, steal, kill, and you'll not just get destroyed or stolen from. You're dead instantly, right? Can you see the metaphor that Paul, the writer of Ephesians 6, is trying to paint? Body armor of righteousness, it is an essential piece. It's important, okay? So what covers that part of me? Since it's a metaphor and we're talking about spiritual warfare in the series, what, what covers my most important spiritual aspects, the vital systems like heart and lungs and organs? Righteousness. Righteousness. It's a big churchy word. I know. What does righteousness mean, right? Google defines righteousness, listen to this, as the quality of being morally right or justifiable. Morally right or justifiable. The problem with this definition is that morally right to one person is not the same as morally right to another especially in this culture we're living in currently, we are so often deceived about what it actually means to be morally right. Our culture, right now, screaming things that are absolutely not morally right, justifiable to a non-Christian American, our generations now, but really all of them, are just not morally right. And pornography, well, we talked about this a little last week, but it's shouted from the rooftops of every TV show out there that it's totally justifiable, normal, necessary even. <sighs> Come on. <laughs> the, our, right by a culture standards are a whole lot of things that just aren't, right by culture standards are absolutely hating on men instead of building them up. Right by culture standards are that everyone has truth and what's, what's true for you might not be true for me. We can have different morals and be justifiable. It's okay. Right by culture standards are that we can do whatever we want with whomever we want, sexually or otherwise, right? And everyone else has to accept it or they aren't morally right. I have a big problem with Google's definition because the Bible definition is acting in accordance with divine moral law. Divine moral law, meaning God's moral law, free from guilt or sin, right? Divine law, meaning you don't get to define what is morally right. God does that. We go to him for our information, how to live our lives, because he is the author of life. He gets to make the rules because he created it in the first place, yeah? I get to make the rules in my household for my children because I created the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Giggles from the mothers in the room. We know. He literally wrote the book on it. God gets to make the rules. I have known Christians in the past <laughs> all about spiritual warfare. Like they live and breathe it. It's what they love to do. They, they stay in the church and pray all night long and they sing and they dance around. They don't crack open their Bibles at home. <laughs> At all, and you can tell, you can feel it on them. I tend to call these over-spiritualized Christians. Over-spiritualized. They've over-spiritualized everything, their belief, their whole faith system. And remember, I always say it's both. We are spiritual and physical. We live in a physical home right now. Jesus was so both. He was so practical and yet spiritual at the same time. The Bible covers that gap so well. We have to keep one foot on the ground sometimes. But uh, over-spiritualized, and I'm giving you this information because we're in the spiritual warfare series, and there is a very real religious spirit that is toxic to the American church. Right? It's, you can tell these kind of, this kind of spirit because the way these individuals live their lives. It's sometimes even the way they speak. 
The Bible doesn't say not to judge other believers, by the way. It says judge them by their fruit. Yeah? Judge them by their fruit. And you can sometimes tell by the way we speak. It's whatever comes into their head is the word of God. And it's meant to this mysterious, like, ethereal, everything is Holy Spirit, everything is spooky, right? It's, they talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, and this is a hint. They talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, but almost never about Jesus or the Bible. If they've got their head in the clouds, it's way up here somewhere. We can do both, yeah? They almost always know way more than you do as well, and they love to hint at that fact right? <laughs> Very much enjoy telling you about their superior faith. Just a hint at what's going on with them spiritually. We're, we're talking a lot about discernment, right? I'm giving you pieces of this. I'm helping you discern the fruit of a believer because so many Christians get way too into the spiritual warfare stuff. They forget how they sound to a non-believer. Sometimes as Christians, we share so many things on Facebook. I don't know how non-believers tolerate us. They probably don't. They probably unfollow us very quickly. And then what's the point of all the things you're sharing on Facebook? Right? And I, the way we sound to a non-believer is important. I, look, it totally 100% hurts your witness when you're over-spiritualized publicly. It just does. It's totally counterproductive to the main mission of Jesus Christ. He wouldn't do that. He didn't do that. We're missing the commander's intent, which is a, a sort of military term, meaning the bottom line. What God wants more than anything is to save the non-believers, right? To bring all of us into his fold, his flock, to, to bring us all into his love. Jesus never got so spiritual that he couldn't relate to sinners anymore. In fact, that was the Pharisees. So spiritual, they didn't even speak the language anymore of the people. The people had to straighten up and make sure they're, they were all good when the Pharisees walked in the room. On their best behavior, when Jesus came into the room, they were comfortable. He went into their homes and spoke to them, right? He was both the most spiritual, perfect person on the planet, and he could still speak with sinners. And he loved them, and they loved him. A religious spirit is just as much of a spirit as a straight-up evil one. They're a little harder to spot, though. And they really, really like control. <laughs> Love control. In fact, sometimes they'll come right up to the pastor and ask for the microphone first day walking in the door. They want to take the spot. They see it as a spotlight, an audience, a stage. It's a completely wrong way of seeing this. It's a deep, important responsibility. And I don't take it lightly, and I don't just hand off a microphone to anybody, right? But they want to take control. They like control. The, I'm not being <laughs> dramatic here. The Bible warns us a lot, a lot more than you think it does, about false prophets. This is not just drama, okay? I, sometimes I, I feel like it's a lot of what we do as pastors, as shepherds. Of, you know, we protect the flock, including super religious and over-spiritualized ones. We're a little extra on guard against this one, maybe. Because churches may be a little extra susceptible. A lot of people actually come into church having been influenced by one of these religious spirits heavily. Because, again, they like control. They abuse, they end up abusing people. And so we come into a church hurting and broken because we've been abused by this religious, toxic spirit. It takes a while to untrain, to heal. All right, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians actually says, test everything. Don't despise prophecies. It, again, we're not stepping out of the spiritual altogether. It is real, it exists, it must be both and, not one or the other. Test everything. Don't despise the prophecies, but test them. Don't you love the Bible? Practical, spiritual. Same hand. Don't despise them. Test them, though. And do you know the way you test the prophet biblically? <laughs> I love this. It's, again, so practical. If what they says comes true, they're for real. So you wait and you see. 
You don't make a quick judgment. If they prophesy something and it comes true, it rings true, it's, it's happened, it's going to happen, it, it's happening, then it's for real. If it's not, it's not. <laughs> So practical and down to earth. I love the Bible for those. The Bible doesn't necessarily teach us to have an open mind. In fact, if we're talking about spiritual warfare, stop opening your mind. Stop. It's dangerous. There are some yoga practices. There are some... Hindu, New Age practices, open your mind, free your mind. It is dangerous. You're opening it to everything out there, and we've already established in this series it's real. Stop. Don't open your mind. Open your mind to the Word. Open your mind to the Holy Spirit, to Jesus speaking to your soul. I'm not saying harden your heart, okay? Open it to the right places. Not much else. Not, don't open it to just anything, <laughs> Discern, use wisdom, test prophecies, know the scriptures, and weigh everything against them. My original point, back to my original point, I guess. I got off a little off track there, but you're, you're opening yourself up to attack if you're not in the word, period. You did it to yourself. Get in the word. Put on the breastplate, the body armor of righteousness, or you're open. You're open to attack. Your heart is open to attack. Your vital spiritual systems, the very air you breathe, is open to attack. Righteousness, godly morality protects our heart, protects our vital spiritual systems. The, the spiritual organs that make the whole body work and function properly as they should are protected by righteousness. In the Old Testament, just to take you a step back into the history of this. In the Old Testament, protection was physical and national, right? God said, I will place my hand of protection on the nation of Israel as long as they obey all the laws of Moses and follow me, especially don't take on other gods, right? No other gods before me, and I will protect you. Anytime Israel stepped outside of those lines, and that's basically most of the Old Testament, they're stepping outside of those lines. They're worshiping other gods. And you see God remove his hand of protection. And they're invaded, plagued by enemies or of some sort. God wanted them. In fact, his plan was to set them up as a shining beacon. They were going to be the perfect nation, functioning well with God as their king. Well, how much better can it be, Right? We have fallible, flawed leaders today all over the planet. They had God as their king. Ultimately, they rejected him. But the, the, the plan was that they would be the shining beacon, the hope of the world, a city on a hill, a shining example of what it means to live by God, with God, for God, protected and blessed by God. They were meant to attract the other nations to them because of their blessing. The world was going to see just how good God was, is. Righteousness protected them physically, nationally. The New Testament, we see a more spiritual and more personal individual protection, right? Jesus now makes it accessible to anyone, not just Israel, but the concept is the same. Our good God wants to bless us. So the, the world can see just how good he is. But how is our witness, our example to the world, how is it reflecting our good God if we're broke, busted, and disgusted, as Latina says, right? All the time. How? How, how are we representing God well, right? The spiritual aspect of this is we're doing it to ourselves, by buying into the lies of the enemy. <laughs> now, I say this all the time. It's simple obedience is your number one spiritual warfare tool. Simple, practical, physical obedience. Just be obedient. Not to culture, not to what you think is right. Be obedient to God. Psalm 34, verse 19 illustrates this just so perfectly. It says, the righteous person faces many troubles, Right? Troubles still come. Rains on the just and the unjust, the Bible says. Troubles still come, but the Lord comes to the rescue, 
each time. Trouble still comes, but the Lord. (laughs) Trouble still comes. No matter what, the righteous person still faces it, but the Lord comes to the rescue. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. (laughs) Calamity will surely destroy the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished, but the Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. So we know how it protects us. Step out of the metaphor for just a second and talk about how to put it on. How do we attain this churchy thing called righteousness and maintain it, right? First of all, God redeems us. God redeems us, but the Lord will redeem those who serve him. God redeems us. Salvation is the first step, right? Jesus covered your sin. He covered your shame. He covered your guilt with his blood. His sacrifice covered all of that, and all you have to do is claim it. Remember from last week, God supplies, we apply. He's already supplied it. Jesus has already sacrificed himself for you been done, taken care of 2,000 years ago on the cross. We're not capable of redeeming ourselves. It's the first thing you have to understand about righteousness. You're not capable. You cannot do this on your own. The Lord redeems us. He sent his son. All we have to then do is call on the name of the Lord, the, the name of Jesus, and we are saved. No other name will save you. No other name will save you. Culture wants to tell you that we are bigots for believing our religion is the only religion. But Muhammad didn't sacrifice himself for you. He didn't sacrifice himself for my sins. He wasn't sinless, so even if he did, what, was, what would be... During the Middle Ages, various Western and Byzantine Christians considered Muhammad to be a perverted, deplorable, false prophet, and even the Antichrist. (laughs) He was actually frequently seen by Christians as a heretic or possessed by demons, which I don't doubt. Some of them, like Thomas Aquinas, who if you study religion, you hear that name a lot. He criticized Muhammad having his handling of doctrinal matters and his promises of carnal pleasures in the afterlife. He was not a good person. Is what I'm trying to say. Even modern criticism has been concerned with Muhammad's sincerity as a prophet, his morality, his marriages, plural, his ownership of slaves, his psychological condition. I think he was absolutely plagued by demons, 100%. Muhammad has been accused of sadism, cruelty, and treatment of his enemies. He was not a good man, is what I'm trying to say. He didn't die for your sins. Gandhi. I just don't research him. It's gross. Didn't die for my sins either. He, he saw black South Africans as barely human. He believed in racial segregation. He also abused his wife psychologically and physically. I mean, all this is very well documented. Claiming to, to learn about compassion from her tears after his repeated aggression toward her. Gross. And he was accused of sexually abusing his nieces. There are all kinds of horrible sexual practices and experiments, spiritual, sexual experiments. That's what I'm saying. Don't look, just don't. It's gross. With young girls. Terrible people. (laughs) Okay? What I'm trying to say is that no other name will save you. So many false prophets. Jesus. Jesus, there's so much parenting coming out of this series, oddly. I wasn't expecting that, but tell your children the truth about other religions. Tell them the truth. I mean, I guess for that you have to know that know the truth and you have to research just a little, but I hear parents trying to be like very compassionate and respectful about other religions. And let me just be clear. You can be respectful about people, of people, without giving the religion validity in your children's eyes. There's a a Hindu flag hanging in Main Street in Gettysburg right now. Instead of hoping my children don't see it, right? I think a lot of Christians go that route. Hoping they don't see it or telling them nice fluffy words about it, I tell 
told my kids straight up, we passed it the last time, it's a Hindu hand symbol. They think it will bring them luck and protection against the evil eye. But they're deceived. You don't need a flag with a hand hanging on it to protect you. Jesus is the only protection we need. Right? It's the only one that works. Hear Christians too, little things. This works as not going under ladders. Not opening umbrellas in the house. Are the, you really put, you're putting your stock in an umbrella. Jesus is the only protection you need. It's the only one that works. Look, we should be praying against that deception for our neighbors, actually. Every time we pass it, let's pray against it. Not against the people, but that God would open their eyes and bring them to the truth. Right? Use it as a reminder to pray for your community. <sighs> I just, I hear parents not being truthful with their kids. Maybe they don't know it all the truth, but tell them straight up, don't let your children find their own way. I stepped on some toes there. I can feel it. Don't, please don't. I'm begging you. We train our children. The Bible says train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. Train children. Don't raise them. Train them. Train them. Test them. Quiz them, right? Every, uh, just in little ways, every Sunday after church on the way home, what'd you guys learn this week? Don't give me, I learned about Jesus. What did you learn? What'd you learn about God? Night before bed, we, I asked my kids five or six questions, and one of them is, what are you learning about God or from God right now? I want them thinking about these things, right? There's not always an answer. They're eight and 11, right? But <laughs> The, the, I want them knowing that I'm going to ask, so they're thinking about it. We do Bible plans. Do you know there are kids' Bible plans on the Bible app? They're awesome. If your kids have little iPads, phones, do them with them. You can see their answers, make them respond to what they're learning about God. It's, there are so many tools out there. Train your children. We don't just raise them. We train them. Teach them. Jesus wasn't any of those things like Muhammad and Gandhi. He wasn't like that. He was sinless sinless. When he talked about selflessness, he actually lived it. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy. He's the only one that's worthy. We've got all kinds of sin going on, but Jesus' blood on the cross covered it. It's a sacrifice for us. Our only hope is Jesus. We will never be good enough to earn the forgiveness of a perfect God. Jesus gave it to you. You hear new Christians sometimes coming to the church weeping. I'm not good enough. I will never be good enough. You don't know what I've done. I don't have to know what you've done because I know what I've done. And I couldn't earn God's forgiveness either, right? We, it's not something that's earned. It's given. Jesus gave it to you. You don't have to earn it. You will never earn it, in fact. So you have to understand that truth in order to fully understand righteousness. Maybe, you know, you've never been tempted to worship Gandhi or Muhammad or Hinduism, Islam, New Age, any of that stuff. But at some point in your life, I can bet you've been tempted to worship yourself. Self is the most worshiped God in America today. I want it. I need it. I'm going to have it. It doesn't matter if I don't have the money or I made a promise to someone or the Bible says not to do it. I want it. I feel attracted to someone, so I guess I need to have them to be happy. I feel like, like someone I'm not, so I guess I must be that person instead of who I was created to be. I should do what makes me happy, right? Is what made you happy yesterday the same thing as what makes you happy today? <laughs> it's deception. That's the problem with making ourselves happy. I tell my kids all the time, too, like, that's not our goal. We're not, my goal is not to make you happy as my child. Because my goal is not to make myself happy as a Christian. I make God happy. I live to please him we live to please him as believers. What will please him right now? But we, we worship ourselves, even in little ways. We don't instruct ourselves enough. The Bible says to instruct yourself. 
teach yourself, remind yourself. We don't tell ourselves what to do. We let our bodies tell us what to do. I'm craving chocolate, so I eat it. I want to sit and do nothing, so I will. I don't feel like reading my Bible today, so I won't. I think I know me better than God does, so I'll do what I want today. I feel like lashing out at a friend, so I will. Right? We let our feelings, our flesh, rule our spirit. Which brings me to the second part of this. We, although God does the work of redeeming, he's already done the work on the cross of redeeming us, we do have a piece of participation in this. We must participate in our own redemption. Maybe not in the way that you think. I was very worried, to be honest, about writing those words and putting them on the screen because I don't want anyone walking away thinking you have to earn it. God did that. It's already done. You are not the Savior. You never will be. That is Jesus, right? But although it might not be in the way that you think, you do have responsibility in this. Jesus said, <clears throat> Mark 10, 18, why do you call me good? Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. We, we deceive our, we talk ourselves into thinking like, I'm, I'm a good person. Surely God wouldn't allow a, a, a good person to go to hell. Jesus, the only one on the planet qualified to say that he was good, said, why do you call me good? Because he would take on the sins of all of us eventually, right? The shame and the guilt in front of God, he would take that on. But he said, only God is truly good. We are not. It's an essential piece that's not often, I don't want to say it's not preached, because I think it's preached, but it's not often accepted in Christianity. <laughs> we want to say that, you know, Jesus' teachings are good and we're all good, truly, deep down. No, we're not. We're not. People say all the time, children are so innocent. Have you raised a young human lately? They're not that, in they're not that good. They're not good people. Toddlers are not good people the most selfish creatures on the planet. We train them to be good. We train them to have manners, to say please and thank you, to be, right? To be selfless. We train that. You don't just grow, have you ever met somebody who hasn't been trained? <laughs> We're not good. That's why we need Jesus, okay? You will never earn it. And it sounds very practical. And some of you are thinking right now, man, I thought this was a spiritual warfare sermon. She's just talking about plain old selfishness. But this is how we let the war begin. We're losing the battle of our souls because we're not running to Jesus with our problems. We're not putting on the armor that's already been supplied for us. Right? This is the only reason. Not because you're not good enough, you're not self-disciplined enough, you're not striving hard enough. You're not putting on your armor. <laughs> Right? You're not reminding yourself that Jesus already paid the price. If he is powerful enough to walk out of that grave, he's powerful enough to help you with your, your lust problem, your greed problem, your finances problem, your pro whatever it is. Do you believe that? We half-heartedly clap about it, but <laughs> if we actually believed it, we wouldn't have a problem trusting him with the rest of it. We wouldn't be constantly trying to grab control back. He is powerful enough. He is good enough. He's got this. The Bible does tell us to avoid temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. Here, a lot of Christians do say things like, you just don't understand. It's so powerful for me. It's in my family. It's in my blood. It's what I've grown up learning. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. This is talking to believers, though. When you've given your life over to Jesus, he doesn't just change you. He, 
renews you. He makes you into a new creature. (laughs) He won't give you more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. In the beginning, we read read Genesis 3 last week, right? Satan didn't destroy Eve's life. He influenced Eve into making decisions that destroyed it herself. She had a choice. We always have a choice in the matter. God gave us free will because love doesn't exist without free will. He gave us a choice. We always have that choice. And Satan's done this to so many others throughout the Bible. He does the same to us now. Instead of him ruining our lives, he give, we give him control to ruin our lives. We give him the right. We allow him to deceive us, and we put down our armor. Jesus already supplied. We just have to apply. Now, I'm just declaring right now in front of God and everybody, the season for self-sabotage is over. Okay, we're suiting up, not doing this anymore, okay? We are suiting up. We are putting on our belts of truth and our body armor of righteousness, okay? We're we're basing our truth on the Bible, not culture, not what's popular, not our feelings. Truth is based on the word of God because he created the earth and everything in it, so he has a right, yeah? He gets to tell me what to do. I'm gonna let him. And now that we are wise to the devil's schemes, I actually found a verse. It's, it's like not even a whole sentence. In 2 Corinthians 2.11, it says, So that Satan will not outsmart us, for we're familiar with his evil schemes. You're really going to say that a rebellious old spirit, ugly, gross spirit is going to outsmart you? Like you're going to give him that power? He has to ask God for permission. You remember the story in Job? He has to go to God, wait in line, ask for permission to come and mess with us. He's not that power. He's, don't get me wrong, he has power, but he's not that powerful. You don't let him outsmart you. We have the word. We can be familiar with his evil schemes. We know what he did in the beginning, so we can guess at what he's going to do now. He's going to try to manipulate us into deceiving ourselves. Now that we know his evil schemes, we're not going to let him outsmart us. We're done with that. No more self-sabotage. We're suiting up. Amen. Are you with me on that? Okay. So we're not using him as an excuse. Right? Using the devil as an excuse as to why we're not holy, we're not righteous, we're not good, not okay. The Bible tells us of his evil plans exposes his strategies. We can know what he's going to do. We have to use discernment. I've been defining discernment this whole series, but I heard a new definition that I really liked this week from Pastor Darius Daniels. He said, discernment is the ability to recognize a pattern and the wisdom to make an adjustment. The ability to recognize a pattern and the wisdom to make an adjustment. So we can see his evil schemes. We have the, the word, the history of thousands of years God has given us on planet Earth to help us see his evil schemes. Now we got to use discernment, recognize a pattern, and make the adjustment. Yeah? God redeems us. We have to stay wise to the plans of the enemy. Remember what Jesus did, or we leave his hand of protection. Proverbs 4, verse 20. I want to read you seven verses here. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them and healing to your whole body. I actually do think there's a small element of this body armor of righteousness that actually affects your body, keeps you healthy. Now, not all the time. I don't want to, I'm not heaping shame or guilt on anyone, okay? We still live in a fallen world, things happen. Your health issue isn't a result of you not putting on the armor necessarily, okay? It's not what I'm saying, but it does. The, the body armor of righteousness tends to keep us healthy too. It, it wards off other things. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet. Stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. We have a responsibility in this. 
right? Salvation is only the first step of living a life of righteousness. God redeems us, but we must continue to strive to be more like Jesus, more loving, more compassionate, more trusting of God's word, less fearful, less skeptical, less bitter and angry. But we don't just do those things by just trying harder, by being more afraid and and shameful and getting on ourselves, right? That's a religious spirit. We do that by practicing the very few pieces of religion that Jesus did build into our faith. Remember Jesus. That's the main thing. Remember what he did on the cross, the power that he has over the grave. Remind yourself constantly. Stay grateful. I've said it so many times this week. It keeps coming up, but... Gratitude is an antidote for a whole lot of things. It just is. Stay grateful. Stay, preach the gospel to yourself daily. You need it every day. Every day. Preach it to yourself every day. Tell yourself what Jesus has done for you. That is how we stay righteous in God's sight. Because what does Psalm 34, 22 say? We just read it. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. The Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. We have to take refuge in him. We have to run to him when we're confused and afraid, when we're angry and hurt, when, when we're grieving and depressed. We don't have to fix those things before we come to him. He is our refuge. Does that make sense? I'm a little worried I'm talking in circles today, and I have... I have a um, illustration here for you. Aaron's going to come and be my lovely assistant with his umbrella. And it's, <laughs> it's going to rain in here. There's two. It's a big, fancy, beautiful umbrella. Look at this thing. I say this for a reason because here's the illustration. It's a rainstorm. Yeah, model it a little. Okay, show them how awesome this umbrella is. Good job. <laughs> it's storming, right? The, the, we, we talked about how trouble comes. Trouble comes. It is raining, lightning occasionally. It's wet out here in this thing we call life. We all get wet. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. Aaron is representing for this metaphor Jesus. He's already holding the umbrella, Right? Anytime we want to, it's available to us. I can step under this thing, huddle under here with him. He provides warmth and shelter. This is his righteousness covering me. He doesn't ask if I'm worthy. Just says, come, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. He wants us to huddle under his shelter out of the rain with him. Yeah? Here's the thing though. We Step out of it all the time. Well, that looks good over there. That that thing has protection over there. In fact, sometimes Satan will throw us his own counterfeit. We talked about... Yeah, Isaiah, Satan, for this metaphor. (laughs) Sometimes Satan will say, hey, I have protection too. But notice how he didn't come up here with me and stand under the umbrella with me, did he? He's away somewhere else, but he says, I I have protection. I have an umbrella just like that one. It's black. It's beautiful. And when we open it, the first time I opened this thing, it actually bit me. I literally was bleeding, which is another great metaphor. This (laughs) This is what we're left with. You see this thing? I'm still soaked under this thing, but I'm standing here holding it all by myself because I think it's adequate protection for me, right? Is it? It's a counterfeit. This is the difference between Satan's righteousness, the things that he offers that he wants to protect you with, and God's. And Jesus is over here saying, come, come to me. But the thing is, I can't really use both. Can I? I can't quite get under here. With both, I gotta put this one down. Kick it to the side a little bit to be able to get under Jesus's protection. Does that make sense? So I am not providing the protection. 
I'm not holding the umbrella. I didn't supply it. He supplied it. I'm just under it. I have to apply it. When I step out, do my own thing, I'm getting soaked. <laughs> and I'm exposed to the elements. And I think Satan is really just hoping we hold on to this thing long enough that a bolt of lightning comes. Right? He wants us to be killed, stolen from, or destroyed. And so just keep holding on a little bit longer. It'll work out. Right? Maybe he even heaps the guilt and the shame on me for the holes in my protection. Right? You're just not doing it right. How dare you? Right? But I'm standing here soaked, exposed, and broken when I could just set this thing down and go join Jesus in his protection. This is the biblical version of righteousness. We don't supply it. This is not mine. I'm not worthy of this. Jesus did that. Does that make sense? You can keep that video playing, but you can go ahead and unpack that up. There is hope in no one else, guys. Not in ourselves. Not in any of the counterfeits that Satan wants to offer. Only Jesus. This righteousness thing, it's, it's not a one-time decision. If Satan is there every day off to the side. Hey, I got this over here, right? It's an everyday thing. We step in and out of his protection, but it's not a one-time moment. It's constant. We constantly take refuge in him. That's why churches every week, 52 Sundays a year, right? It's, it's why communion must be daily. We we pray over our food when we eat. It's why we, we must be in our Bible daily. We must fast and pray. We're reminding ourselves constantly of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. In fact, this is another spiritual warfare tool. Let's take communion at home. Take communion at home doesn't have to be wine and bread necessarily. Jesus said, when you're together, break bread together. I think this is actually where the practice of praying over your food came from. It's not meant, communion isn't meant to be every six weeks at church from these little cups with the crappy tasting wafer and the little, right? This is not, (laughs) there's nothing spiritual about this. It is the practice of remembering Jesus and it's meant to be all the time. I think Jesus built it into a meal because it's meant to be daily, multiple times a day. When you're eating, when you're feeding yourself, remember what he's done for you. Constantly remind yourself. Because that righteousness, it covers you. It protects your heart. Some of us are running around with these broken hearts because we messed up. Not because the world messed up, the people are mean, someone broke our heart, but because we gave our heart to the wrong person. We stepped outside of that coverage. We chose to go our own way with it. We didn't trust God enough to have our back. The awesome thing about Jesus' protection is the longer you're in there with him, the more that sweet, awesome umbrella becomes permanent. (laughs) It becomes a, a, like you're building it together. You build this hut and it has walls and then it has a roof and then you're you're building more and more as your faith grows you're building that protection around you you've now learned a thing or two Jesus is teaching you how to build it and then you can go and show others you bring that protection around with you too right be smarter with your heart give it to God let God protect you. I think that's really what righteousness after salvation it comes down to. Trusting God enough. Trusting Him and Him alone to protect you. Trusting Him to let Him Him tell you how to run your finances. To let Him control your life, your sex life, your marriage, your, your relationships. Let Him control what you entertain yourself with. What you watch and read and do. Trust Him enough to live within his righteousness. Righteousness is not just about what you're not doing. So far in the series, we've talked a lot about repenting, stopping doing certain things. It means turning from your wicked ways and turning to God. 
stopping. We've talked a lot about that so far. And sometimes to pursue righteousness, yes, you have to stop doing some things. But this is also about what you are doing. It's not just passive. Okay, you've got to replace some of those bad behaviors with good ones. Some of us have given a whole lot of control over to our bodies. We're killing ourselves. And Satan has convinced us that we need to drink too much alcohol, smoke too much, spend too much, eat too much, have sex outside of marriage, whatever it is, that we need to give our bodies these things because it wants them. We're totally bought in. No control left. And so when we talk about repenting and turning from those things, we have no idea how to do that. Again, the Word gives you the roadmap for how to do that. Fasting does that. It's one of the spiritual disciplines, which there's a whole list of them in the sermon notes. Don't have time to get into each one individually, but they, practicing the spiritual disciplines, it's disciplining yourself how to tap into the righteousness of God before you need it often. Because it's not always raining, right? Sometimes the sun comes out, it shines on us for a little bit, and that umbrella doesn't seem so bad. We can do this, right? I got this all by myself. But the storms inevitably come. Trouble inevitably comes. So if we're training ourselves to tap into Him in the good times, in the sun, when the storms come, we're not as likely to get off track. We're not as likely to get soaked. Our lives spiraling into chaos. We can trust in the Lord because we have a foundation built on rock. Not on wishy-washy sand. Now, we live in a world that is tough to do this in a godly way. I'm not saying this is easy. It's tough to trust God when the world is screaming at you to do something else. But we have to be intentionally discipling ourselves, instructing ourselves to run back to Him. If you're having trouble controlling yourself, you are in good company. In fact, Paul, the best evangelist in history, had trouble too. Uh, he said, I struggle against flesh all the time. I don't understand myself. I do what I know I shouldn't do, and I don't do what I know that I should do. I, I can't figure myself out. But guess what? Jesus covers it all. Call on him, and he will cover it. He will teach you how to live a better life. But there will come a point when he will ask you to give up that thing completely. Like we build faith. Remember, God teaches us in little increments. He, he pulls us along according to our faith. Step out in what faith you have. And, and he shows us little by little. But eventually he's going to say, okay, you can do this now. It's time to give that thing up and try something else. Try it my way. My way is easy. The burden is light. Right? Discipline yourself and live within God's protection. Practice fasting. Practice reading your Bible. Practice praying. Practice true worship. Right? These are things that it's not just about stopping. It's about starting. Some of us don't need to stop anything today. We just need to start something. We need to, to build in a practice in our lives of reminding ourselves who Jesus is and what he's done. We're reminding ourselves. We're being grateful. Remembering who Jesus is and what he's done for us. We're staying under that umbrella of protection, keeping that body armor up. We're suiting up, right? Today we're going to take this communion together as a practice. If you received one on the way in, it's this little cup. If not, there's some ushers coming down the aisles, wave at one of them. Now, communion is not for people who don't believe. Okay? This is for those who believe to remind yourself or reminding ourselves. Jesus said, as you break bread together, as you eat bread together, remember my flesh broken for you. Remember that I sacrificed my body on the cross for you. It bled. It was beaten. 
right at all the anger of God taken out on sin in one person. He took that on. He chose to take that on. He was strapped to the cross, but I heard a preacher say this week, he would have held on just for you. They didn't need to latch him to that cross. He chose to go to that cross, and he would have held on to it just for you body broken. He chose to allow his body to be broken. He could have changed it all in an instant. One word, one thought from God himself would have gotten him off of that cross, right? Would have healed his body. He chose to withstand all of that. Allow God to take out his anger on the sin. Your sin. My sin. In that one moment. That's what we're remembering when we eat this bread. Let's eat it together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And when we drink together, remembering his blood poured out He actually died. They took life from the life giver. He allowed them to take everything from him. The grave steals so much from us, doesn't it? The curse of sin goes back to Adam and Eve. And they chose selfishness. They chose to want to be on God's level. death came into the world. It was never meant to be that way. God didn't want us to experience the curse of sin, the death. It's not natural. It's why we feel so unnatural when we lose someone. Jesus isn't beholden to death, though. And he gives each and every one of us that same right. In him, we're no longer beholden either. We get to dance on streets of gold with Jesus after death because of what he did on that cross, because all of his blood was poured out, not just some of it, because he gave his life for you. And he rose again three days later, proving that he has the power over the grave. That we're not beholden to any of this anymore. That he not only has the power, he has the right to save us. He earned it on that cross by taking all of our sin and shame. He gave it to us as a gift. Let's drink together and remember that. deserve his forgiveness, yours. I don't deserve to live within your protection. I choose my own way all the time. I do things I know I shouldn't do. I don't do things I know I should do. I'm not deserving in any way, shape, or form, but Jesus, you gave that to me. We're just so grateful today, God. Help us remember every day what you've done for us. Help us forgive others because of your forgiveness. Help us learn to rely on you and only you for our protection, for our guidance, for the the wisdom and discernment that we need in this life. Help us live it for you so that we can be attractive to others, so that they can look at our lives and see just how far we've come because of you. 
God, let us never forget that it's not about us. It's all about you. Heads bowed and eyes still closed today. Or maybe you've never made a decision to live for Jesus. Maybe you've never given your life to him. You've never thanked him for the forgiveness. But today you believe you're grateful and you want to start living your life for him. Maybe it's the first time or the first time in a long time. If that's you when you're in the room, I'm not going to ask you to, to get up and, and stand up and dance around or come to the front, but just to slip your hand up right where you're sitting. Right, if you would say, I believe in Jesus, first time or the first time in a long time, would you just raise your hand? And this isn't, this isn't to embarrass you or make everybody look at you. Everybody's heads are, are bowed and eyes are closed. This is just between you and God to say, I believe. I believe. And we see in the word that it sometimes takes a confession you have to say it out loud. You have to do something to mark that spot in your life. If, if that's you, raise your hand. Raise it up high. And Usher's just going to come and give you a little card to help you with that decision. If you're watching online, you can text the number on the screen or type I'm in in the comments. We say, I'm in around here. I'm in to following Jesus. I'm in to his forgiveness having a, a relationship with my Heavenly Father. I'm in. Maybe today you're saying, I, I know there's some things I have to stop, but really, today I want to commit to starting some things. I want to look over the spiritual disciplines list. I want to watch start class and then learn about them all. I, I want to use the 40 IMs in everyday life. I want to start taking communion. I want to try a fast, whatever it is. I have a lot of resources in the sermon notes today. There's a lot of different ways you can go with this, but start doing something today. Build a practice in your life of remembering, of reminding yourself who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Maybe you've been a Christian 40 years. Find a new one. Practice a new one. Almost all of us, we need pieces of this, right? We could always use more reminders in everyday life. If that's you, you just want to commit to starting something, would you raise your hand? Father, I thank you and I praise you for each and every person in this room with a hand raised, hearts humbled toward you. Father, we are reaching out to you. We we're huddling under your protection, your umbrella of protection, your righteousness. We're suiting up in this series. God, meet each and every person right where they're at. Whether they're just starting out or they've been in this a long time, meet them there. Speak to hearts and minds. Help them be open and receptive to your voice and your voice alone. Help us to suit up. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give Pastor Candace?